All right, it's 5.30. We'll call the regular select board meeting to order. First on the agenda is public comment. This is anything that's not on the agenda currently. Um, hi, this is this is Josh. Um, how you doing? Good to see all of you. Um, I, I wanted to uh, just mention um, some of the work that the Working Communities Challenge White River Valley team um, has done. And um, and we uh, we completed our planning phase recently and submitted an implementation grant. Uh, and I have a summary document that I'll uh, I'll send around to all the select board members um, tomorrow. Uh, so I'll I'll refrain from going over the whole thing. Um, but uh, we worked, you know, the summary of you know we worked with uh, individuals. Um, from uh, communities all across the White River uh, Valley over the, the, this, the last several months. Um, individuals from Braintree, Bethel, Brookfield, Chelsea, Granville, Hancock, Pittsfield, Randolph, Royalton, Rochester, Sharon, Stratford, Stockbridge, and Tunbridge. Um, and, you know, we came up with a, a, a vision for the proposal. Um, and we are going to be interviewing um, with the jury from the uh, steering committee on October 23rd. Um, we are one of eight teams uh, that were awarded planning funds. And um, so hopefully we'll, we'll find out in November um, what the outcome is. Um, the pandemic certainly put some challenges um, into our work, um, and uh, but I think overall, you know, bringing so many people together over so many communities for the first time ever um, was was successful, and uh, we uh, we have some some activities that were in the that were still in the planning phases that we're looking to execute over the next couple months uh, to use up the residual planning funds. Um, and to help um, increase the, the collaborative uh, nature that we've uh, taken this approach with, um, to, to, with a goal of really uh, identifying collaboration in the Valley um, and uh, working towards, uh, you know, making things happen um, and, and identifying us as a, as a region. Um, so, um, I just wanted to give you guys that that quick update. Uh, we didn't put together our summary here in quick enough time um, to uh, to get on the agenda, but it was important for me to to give you guys a little update on where we are and what the future holds of the uh, Working Communities Challenge Wave River team. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Uh, just for the minutes, uh, we have Devin that just signed on. Can we get a last name? That's um, uh, not the right name. This is Emery Mathias, administrative assistant. Okay, the hat must have thrown me. Uh, <laughs> and we have the 3903 number that called back in. If we could uh, get a name on that, please. If you're giving us your name, you're on mute. All right, we're not gonna get any cooperation there. So uh, let's move down to approval of the agenda. I move that we uh, approve the agenda. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stained? Motion carries. Consent calendar. This is meeting minutes from September and warrants. The my apologies. The date for under consent calendar for meeting minutes should actually be seventeen. Um, those are the minutes that the, the select board has already approved September tenth. So it should be September seventeen. Okay. 
Move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. New business, the first item is a candidate review for the Orange Southwest School District Board. I assume that's what Lincoln is here for. Yes, we do have um, members of the school board. Uh, I believe Lane is on the call. Uh, just in, in accordance with state requirements, the board is required to, to at least consider uh, a candidate that is proposed for appointment. And um, you have received the candidate's material and Lane is on the call um, to, to share more about the candidate. Yeah, I can um, give folks a, a little overview and um, try to answer any questions that, that uh, you may have. Um, Paul Parsons, um, who served on the Orange Southwest School Board for the last six years and has represented Randolph, um, has resigned. Um, and on behalf of myself and the OSSD board, we want to thank him for his six years of service. Um, with his resignation, uh, we advertised the opening and received one response. And so we're seeking um, input from the select board um, as we consider the appointment of Megan Salt to Paul's open position. Um, if she is appointed, she would serve in that position until the end of Paul's term um, in March of 2021. Um, she's a graduate of RUHS and lives on Crab Apple Ridge in Randolph. She worked in various positions at Gifford Medical Center from 2007 until 2020. She is currently a marketing specialist for the National Life Group um, in Montpelier. She possesses an associate's degree in behavioral science. Um, <laughs> crisis victim advocate and is a tobacco treatment specialist. And most recently, um, last year, she volunteered to help run the tobacco cessation program um, at Randolph Union High School and is thought of highly by the high school staff. Um, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions folks may have. Elaine, there was a, a flurry of uh, activity out on Facebook today and yesterday uh, centered mostly around days that the school's open and when are they going to go to more than two days and whatnot. And in that, it came out that the select board was going to be considering this tonight. And there was a whole lot of angst about we didn't know there was an opening. Had we known, we would have been applying and whatnot. So I'm not sure I mean, how this got advertised, but do you feel like there was a process open enough by which parents impacted by the various schools would have known there was an open or not the various right they have to be from randolph but the parents in randolph would have known this opening was out there and had an opportunity to submit interest uh yeah not not only was it discussed at our school board meetings it was published in the paper um it was published a month or two back um and we had to wait a little while after the the closure of um that that opening i think we had it open for about 10 days which was what was required um, because we had to wait for uh, the legislature um, to determine the process um, for ensuring how to appoint um, a person kind of midterm um, as we're attempting to do here with megan so, so i'm sure there's probably recent recent um interest at this point in time, but this position was open properly um, about, about a month and a half or so ago. So assume that I'm a parent or an interested person and I don't tune into the school board meetings and I don't buy the paper, how else might I, was it in a parent newsletter or anything like that? Uh, yes. So if they got their newsletter, they should have known. Yeah, and um, one of the things that I found in, in coming into the, the district um, early on, one of the big discussions I had was about the best way to communicate uh, with the members of the district, and by and far, um, their comments were the local paper. That's what, what they read, that's what they check. Thank you.
Any questions, comments, thoughts? Um, I'm fine with what's going on. I'd make a motion if you want it. So I'd make a motion to recommend that uh, they put Megan Salt on the school board for the remainder of the term. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. You have a new member, a new recommendation, Lane. I thank thank you very much um, for taking the time today. Uh, can I just say for the for the record that the um, the school of member who's leaving his last name is Putney. Yep. Oh, okay. sorry, sorry about that. You said Parsons. Yeah. 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 No, that's that's my bad. It's been a long six months, <laughs> and I know Paul very well, and I work very closely with him. Great. Up next is new biz uh, under new businesses town policies. First is a proposed comp time policy. Sorry, I muted myself and I never thought I would do that, but I was muted. Sorry, everyone. Um, the, the nexus of uh, the comp time policy came from a conversation that uh, started between Cliff and I several months ago. Uh, we had discussed a way to potentially improve the quality of life of our salaried employees uh, based on uh, existing policies that exist for our hourly employees in, in several of our departments. Um, what we came up with was a potential for allowing staff that work, you know, for example, um, uh, I'll give our rec director, for example, um, she puts in a great amount of hours outside of the, the standard, you know, 80 uh, per pay period. And, you know, many of the managers and, and directors do, but um, this was an opportunity for us to be able to to make it so that our managers feel uh, like the extra hours that they are putting to make their job more successful and to make their programming more successful is being rewarded. Um, so we're, we're, we're attempting to find a way to allow the salaried em uh, employees to keep track of the extra hours that they put into their work uh, and potentially use that comp time as comp time first um, before they start using vacation time. Uh, one of the strategies that, or one of the options that we have is to not necessarily make this comp time, not, not attach any value, monetary value, so that it is encouraging to staff to use the time to improve their quality of life, but not become a, a financial drain to taxpayers who are understanding that we hired somebody on a salary, uh, which you know sometimes leads to more than 40 and 80 hours in a pay period. So just some background on this um, from the state side of it. When we have folks that are in management positions, uh, we cap them out the same value. Uh, we're allowed to take 80 hours of, of uh, comp time for work we do above our 40 a week. But that's for the full year. Um, and it lasts, we can only carry it for six months beyond the end of the fiscal year. Um, and it, ha it has to be pre-approved. So when we have a major event like Irene, believe it or not, those of us that are in management positions, we only got 80 hours extra for those type of activities. Wow. Um, so uh, the 80 hours is a standard for, for how the state looks at this, if anybody's looking for a comparison. Is the six month, um the six month cap uh, after the end of the fiscal year, what, what um, uh, you would recommend Adolfo that we consider? Uh, I think that works well. We're trying to remain as, co as consistent as possible with models that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the model that Trini talks about on the state level works great. So this way, if there's ever an issue, we can always rely on consistency and, and models that already exist. Um, you know, as, as, you know, 
you know, the nail that sticks out gets hammered is one of those, you know, uh, tales right. that exists out there. But in this case, we want to make sure that if, if something is in place with the state that we can, we can try to mimic our policy to that, so that there's less, there's less of a divergence and there's less of an issue with us creating a violation with HR regulations. So, um, yeah. Adolfo, could you explain the last sentence in the longer paragraph? Uh, let me bring it up here. <clears throat> so what we're trying to again do is, um, I'm assuming, Pat, that you, you mean the however accumulated yeah. and unused? Yeah. Yeah, what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage the use of the time and not the ongoing banking of the time. So we're trying to not attach any monetary value to it. Um, so in other words, staff can't then say, well, I banked 80 hours of comp time. The town needs to pay me 80 hours worth of work. So we're trying to essentially say there's no monetary value attached to this time. We want to make sure that people use it and its intent is to be used for you know for just to be away from work to to recharge batteries as opposed to i'm comping all this time so that i'm paid an additional 80 hours cash value at the end of the six months or the end of the year what what is the unless uh, uh, as approved uh used as approved leave time uh mean as an exception uh, and I think I get it, but I just want to be clear. In fact, can I speak to that? <clears throat> Since yeah, I, sure, I, I, um, <clears throat> what that's getting at, Tom, is that um, the approved leave time means that you're, you're taking the time off from work and you can get paid for, for those hours. So very much like using vacation time. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. I get it. What would be a circumstance where someone might be um, eligible to be approved for something like that? Uh, let's say they, you know, um, for example, a salaried director banks 80, um, you know, whatever is eight hours and they want to take a, the, the use the comp time. Um, they would essentially have to, they can't just disappear for a Friday and they get a three day weekend. They would have to come to their supervisor or essentially to the town manager at the time and say, hey, look, I've got eight hours of comp time banked. I want to turn in what we have. We have a, a leave sheet that staff turn in for whatever day they're going to be away. And they have to tell us what type of leave they're going to be using so that we can track it properly. So essentially, when they do that, they're essentially asking for permission to use the time to be away. And when they have the comp times, you know, we have the leaves separated by comp time, vacation time, sick leave. If they check comp time and I approve it and, you know, turn it into finance, that will trigger that employee to continue to be paid for those eight hours for that day, even though they are away on comp leave. Hmm. So that's the approval mechanism is that their supervisor or the town manager is approving the use of comp time and also proving that the town will pay them for that day, even though they're not at work. So going the other step, Adolfo, what does an employee have to do that's above and beyond what the salary that was set for that position took into consideration, knowing they would be working different hours and whatnot, like the rec director? Mm -hmm. What do they have to do to allow it to be credited towards an accumulation of comp time. How do we know what activity is that person going to do that then triggers them to be able to bank some portion of that 80 hours? Well, as, as much as possible, we, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of this will be left to um, us trusting the directors to know what they're doing um, and to not violate, you know, the trust of their supervisors. Uh, I do meet with staff uh, regularly, um, and during those meetings, I learn of projects that are coming up. Uh, you know, again, using the rec example, we'll learn that uh, planning for 
uh, soccer events are coming up. And so those are going to take extra time or a rec committee meeting is coming up and the employee you know, is working their normal 40 hours and then has to participate in a rec committee meeting that'll last two or three hours. Um, so it's those type of activities that we know of that we can bank. Um, we're also not, you know, something that we could continue to, what, one thing that we can do to strengthen this is uh, put in a clause that says any banked time must be pre-approved. So then it's, it's an, an overt uh, action by the employee to say, look, I'm banking these four hours. Is it of an approved four hour bank? Um, I, I think Trini, I understand that the concern there is that there is the potential for abuse. If, if, you know, if we have an unethical person that just deciding they're going to bank multiple hours every week, we hope that wouldn't happen, but, but, yeah, maybe we could find a way to strengthen the comp time policy so that we know when people are banking comp time as opposed to just trusting them that they're banking appropriate comp time. We currently do have a form for that Adolfo too, um, for the supervisor to sign off for the hours to go into the comp time bank. We could maybe use the same form, right Cliff? That, that's for our hourly employees, correct? Uh, essentially right. for, yeah. So I would say if I was a citizen looking at this, that uh, not to pick on Haiti, but if you applied for that position, it, we probably explained that there was a rec committee and they would be expected to be at those meetings and that this doesn't follow the traditional nine to five schedule you know, lining up soccer camp or going to rec meetings, I wouldn't think would classify as above and beyond what that was set. Now, if you had, a, you know, a tournament coming to town, for example, and you had to put extra time in to coordinate all that, that I would think would classify as above and beyond what the job expectation was, you know, when you took it and the salary was set. Yeah. You know, I think um, when we look at it at the state level, we're looking at something that happens that's above and beyond your normal required duties, right? So I could be in Burlington till 10 o'clock at night on a project meeting, but I'm expected to be at these project meetings. So that just becomes part of my normal work hours. Mm -hmm. But I can have a, an embankment wash away and need to go in the middle of the night to figure out how we're going to keep a road from going into the railroad or whatever, those I can count towards accumulating my 80 hours for the year. That makes sense. Yeah, oh, I, I agree. That, that triggers that little bit of extra above, you know, you're on, you know, you've got COVID hit and you've got to figure out how you're going to sort out summer camp and keep a, you know, a certain number of kids and keep them apart and whatnot, that's going to require extra hours. That would trigger an above and beyond. Um, yeah. So, Trini, yeah. If, if you're at a, um, or any state uh, employee is at a, let, let's say at a meeting until 10 or 11 at night, um, midnight, whatever, are you anticipated to be back at your desk at nine the next morning? Yep. Or, okay, yep. so, so you don't have flexibility uh, within that. So if you're a regular, if you're an employee who is considered a classified position, mm -hmm. then uh, you automatically fall into the time and a half. So the our employees in the town level that are um, not managers fall into the same category kind of as the state employees do. So you get your time and a half, you're, you follow the normal. When you get into a manager position, that's when we fall into this. And I think that's what Adolfo is looking at with this policy is our managers who are paid a salary versus a per hour rate and they have to do something above and beyond what the scope of their job was when that salary was set. So these kind of odd off tasks that take more time than what they kind of expected they would to begin with. Mm -hmm. 
And so at the state level, when we have things like this that happen, you have a set value, which is 80 hours of comp time that you can take. Now, the there are instances where the governor will step in and then sign a document which then pays the managers for the extra time. So we got into, I'm gonna guess here, but I bet we were six, seven weeks into Irene when that document got signed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at that point, then we were allowed to go and track our, go to track hourly for those of us that were living it day and night. But um, on an ongoing basis, it's an attempt to try to differentiate between what happened you know, when your job scope was set and your hours and your wage were put to it versus these oddball things that come in, you know, and to continue with like the, the rec example, you know, a tournament coming into town or an event taking place that's not a normal event. We start a, a whole new thing, a summer solstice event, or, you know, I don't know what it is that takes extra effort. You know, when they mm -hmm. started coordinating for the Winterfest, for example, that's above and beyond what was in the scope when that position was hired and the salary was set. Right. So we'll, we need some language to add it to this document to reflect this sort of above and beyond um, requirement for this time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, uh, we, we just wanted to make sure that Cliff and I, if we worked on this, we're not working on something that the board was just vehemently opposed to. Uh, and now that we get a, a good sense of what the board you know, understands and, and wants us to focus on, we can certainly um, alter the language, work on it, and bring it to a future meeting. Okay, it sounds good to me. Yeah. I think it's only fair because we're asking them to give up time that they would otherwise have with their family and friends and doing things they want to do yeah. versus work. There yeah. ought to be some way of recognizing that. So mm -hmm. more time off to do that makes sense. Yeah. Right. It needs to be as clear as possible so everybody's treated equally though. The yeah. word needs to be as clear as possible. Thanks everyone for the suggestions. Okay, so we'll see that one come back. Um, amendments to the purchasing policy. Uh, yes, um, I'll just give a quick intro and Cliff has um, been uh, doing yeoman's work on this. So uh, we have found that there are some just general issues with the purchasing policy that we've had in place for a number of years. Um, uh, most of them have, most of the issues have been seen by Cliff and his team and, and during his time. So uh, we thought we would introduce some amendments and uh, Cliff, if you're still on the call, um, take it away. I am here. Um, I think the biggest thing is, you know, I think it's been about five or six years since this policy was updated. Um, and the biggest thing is the threshold for initiating a purchase order. And what's happening is that we're getting into the realm as pricing goes up on various um, um, needs for the town. We're getting into the realm of we're having to fill out purchase orders based on this policy at $500 for what I consider routine purchases like maintenance of trucks or um, getting somebody out to repair some electrical circuits, um, things of that nature. And the other thing that um, the other piece that's that's really a, a change is adding the um, the end of the second paragraph by making it clear that if an employee goes out and purchases something on their own, that they're not going to re get reimbursed the sales tax that the town would not have paid. Um, but that, like I said, I think the biggest thing that um, I'm asking for, and and a lot of the changes are related to this, is moving the trigger for needing a PO from $500 to $750. So given the process that you have to go through for a PO, why would we not increase that more and make it that they need manager approval to a certain level and then an official PO after that? Um, well, 
I, I, I actually would like to see it go to $1,000. I'm not <laughs> sure that I would have gotten um, the board to go for that big of a jump. Well, um, I would have. I, I would have too. The reality here is that if, if we went to $1,000, we would eliminate, we, we've made over 200 purchase orders in fiscal 20, uh, 20, 2020. And fully a third of those would have gone away if we were at $1,000. And it's a fair amount of work to go through the process of gener generating the purchase order, both on the department head um, to do the, the legwork to get there and also on the finance department to actually generate it. I would fully support that going to a thousand dollars and having another level of just where the manager signs off on the invoice also, if it's say 500 to a thousand. I would agree with that. <clears throat> it doesn't take long to burn up a thousand bucks on a truck repair. Well, our purchases right now with how expensive certain items are following COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I can Cliff. spend that in nails in a day. <laughs> uh, Cliff, if I may ask, how would this work with something like the uh, Arts and Culture Committee's proposal for the downtown mural project for which we've gotten a $6,000 challenge grant from the uh, Byrne Foundation? The total cost of that project is uh, estimated to be $12,000. So we're trying to raise a $6,000 match. Um, uh, but the artist has already been chosen. Um, it, it, it says here under item four on uh, under categories of procurement that um, uh, purchases over ten thousand uh, dollars of taxpayer or ratepayers dollars must be subject to open competition. I think we've already fulfilled that to some degree, um, but I just. I think I think the key there, Tom, is um, taxpayer ratepayer dollars. Okay. Um, you know, your your number of things is you know because you're not expending taxpayer dollars, um, they wouldn't be necessarily subject to these. I things. see. Okay. I, yeah, I that, still that I still would like the purchase order. Yes, you, know, you had indicated that to me. Yeah. From, from a um, <clears throat> from a um, a management standpoint, to make sure that we're not spending more money than what we've got. Right. Okay. Okay. That's pretty much what I anticipated. I just wanted to get clarification on that. Yeah. Any other comments or questions on this? What is the, if we re, if we increase to a thousand dollars, what does this do to all your other um, values in here? Um, I would I would move them up um, to reflect the additional dollars and jump. Um, you know, I would work through it and make sure that the, the other values made sense, Trini. Okay. No. Unless anybody has any opposition to that, I'd like to see the purchase order requirement be for a thousand dollars or more. I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. Good for me. Me too. I will read. See, Cliff, I will... you are worried for nothing. <laughs> What's that, Trini? I said, see, you are worried over nothing. Uh, that's true. No fate. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh. Uh, so with that, we'll look for another uh, draft of that one and move on to the delinquent tax policy. Another one of yours, probably, Cliff, huh? Yeah, well, I started it, yeah. Um, th this is, you know, as I worked through this and I, and I actually, you know, this was my first year as delinquent tax collector. And as I applied various things, various pieces of this um, going through the, the tax collection process and writing writing payment agreements and um, and essentially holding people's feet to the fire to make them to get them to pay um, I realized that from an administrative standpoint I didn't always necessarily like how the words um, were in the document and some things weren't really um, clear 
as to how the process was going to work. And I, you know, I got some pushback from some taxpayers um, regarding the recording of the lien on the property when the prop, you know, when the tax bill went delinquent, um, and some of the other things that were, um, you know, there was some surprise out there when I actually required payments on the payment agreements rather than a deferral. Um, and so I wanted to be very clear that a payment agreement um, required monthly payments, um, not, hey, we'll wait until next March to pay you. Um, and so the language, there's a lot of wordsmithing in here and some tightening up of the requirements. So when we look at uh, the waiver we gave uh, with the last property taxes due and we've got another tax bill coming and we haven't talked about whether we would um, do anything with that one yet. How does that impact a policy like that? Should, should it make any changes in what we do or do we just still go with the, if it hasn't been paid in a certain, does that, push any dates out for you or make this more challenging? Um, it, it depends on what the motion is, Trini, and, and what, the, what the waiver is. If you actually move the tax due date um, that the legislature this year or the governor's office made clear that the select board could do, um, that, that shifts everything down and, and makes the policy um, start from when new, the new payment date is. Um, last year, the select board didn't move the payment date. They only said, we're not gonna charge you an interest and penalty for 90 days, for three months. And so the clock was still ticking. They were still late, but they just weren't being charged for being late. And if we change the due date, then that makes, makes it easier on you right? Because you don't have just a delay in interest and penalties. It delays everything. The whole process kicks in at a later date than it would have if we hadn't made a motion to do anything, correct? That, that, that's my interpretation of it, yes. Um, I'm not sure if it's any easier or more difficult. It you, just you know, delays when, you happen to do it. <laughs> What's that? It just delays you happen to do it, right? Yeah, so that's true. <laughs> our goal is to have less in there that you have to do by giving a delay at that point. And, and actually, this year worked pretty good. I went to I went to Ann and Joyce this this past last week after the um, September thirtieth passed, and we had one page of outstanding tax bills. Um, and and they're, they're all but one are on payment agreements. Mm. How does nice. that compare to previous years? Uh, well, Joyce and Ann said that they've never seen it on one page. That was so, better. Um, yeah. so, so I think I think we're in pretty good shape. And, I, and I've been um, chasing down people who have been missing payments and allowing letting them know that they're in default of their agreement and if they um and to, that the collection process will continue if they don't um make amends to cure the default yes yeah, surprisingly just to add to what cliff had mentioned um we found that the help given given by the select board uh to folks really helped those that that, that just needed the you know the, the little bit of help uh, they still paid, uh, those that could paid on the second deadline that was issued by the board. Uh, so we found that, you know, just in uh, substantive you know, conversations that we had among staff that we were not very far off where we typically are year, year to year with outstanding payments um, when all was said and done. And even though there were folks that did not pay payments, even though, let's say the dollar amount was still fairly high for folks immediately after the, the normal deadline. Um, those are folks that we knew were going to pay. They were just fighting their time a little bit, trying to see if, you know, uh, there were some, some, some businesses that had high dollar payments that needed to be made. And as soon as the next deadline came around, those payments were made. So dollar value wise, um, we weren't really that far off and it just seemed like the select board really helped those that 
that needed a little bit of a push. So we're sitting here a few weeks ahead of the next payment being due. Um, we have a new policy in front of us to consider tonight. Do we also want to consider any type of action on this round of property tax payments? Well, we haven't, uh, Cliff, you probably would know more than I. As far as I've heard from residents, I, don't, I haven't heard anyone come to us to say they're anticipating trouble in paying their taxes. So, you know, that's not to say that folks are usually open about, you know, missing a payment. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, Cliff, I don't know if you've received any forewarning of folks not being able to pay. I, I have not gotten any inkling that... Um, there, there's been any kind of um, delay in payments. And in fact, so far our tax collection since the bills have gone out has been very robust. We've probably collected about a half a million dollars so far, which is in a short time, the bills didn't go out until September 24th, 5th, something like that. And so we're two weeks into it and you know, people were just waiting for the bills. And I think that there's some of that going on that they got the money for their taxes and they've um, gotten it out of their hands and into ours. <clears throat> I wait so I can come trick or treat when I pay mine. <laughs> I figure the least I can get is a chocolate bar clip. <laughs> when you mail them to me in a manila envelope, the least you should do is include a chocolate bar. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if all the bills, I'm a delinquent tax collector, not the tax collector. <laughs> So you can send the chocolate when you send the delinquent bill. <laughs> um, I wonder if, um, considering how the extension did seem to work for a, a relatively small group of people, but for those people, it seemed to have been, you know, important, um, and that it didn't affect overall collections in a significant way. Um, you know, given the fact that for some folks, um, unemployment benefits have been cut and mm -hmm. might be having some other problems, even though we haven't heard from people saying that they're having problems, doesn't mean that there isn't any um, you know, suffering out there right now. And it seems like a, a really a small thing that, that we can do, which might have some you know, pretty big impacts on maybe even if just a small number of families, but considering- But it's gonna be, it could be significant because as you said, Larry, you know, with the unemployment situation and that extra money not there anymore, um, you know, in a couple of weeks, that could become a bigger deal here. So I wonder if we if we do an extension like we just like we did last time. Um, like, I, I, it's hard for me to see why we wouldn't, you know, do that, con considering the, the very sort of small cost to the town. If it's helpful at all. Um, what what what. Um you know, I could commit to doing is over the next, you know, few days and even the next week or two <clears throat> is reach out to folks that do provide social services to folks in their community, ask if they have received any kind of um, inkling or feeling or actual more direct verbal communication from the community, the community that they service, or even just in general from the community of a potential need for not paying their taxes on time. Uh, and then once I have that information, I could share with the board and, and potentially if, if it's that dire request that a special meeting be held before the deadline of the 31st to take to take action. Um, and I suggest that because I uh, because it's not on the agenda now, it would be I wouldn't say it would be a challenge. It's anything's possible. But, um, you know, one can say, well, it wasn't on the agenda to be considered, you know, whatever the case is. But if we have a special meeting. Um, it could be the primary thing and then it could happen with, with more information that staff can collect from residents. And the other thing to consider too is that the October deadline that's coming up on us does not have a penalty attached to it. The, the only thing that happens when that one goes delinquent is, is the interest kicks in. The, the penalty doesn't happen until the March 31st deadline passes. So we can waive the interest. Right. But, or delay it. And I would argue that delinquent tax policy is on the agenda. Yeah, uh, no, that's true. Even though it's proposing to be there, and I would much rather deal with this tonight than 
have a special meeting that we all have to commit time to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm more than willing to entertain a motion that we do the same thing we did with the March payment. So moved. Second. So before you, could I, could I just interject? <laughs> <a second here? laughs> not, not, not that I'm going to oppose it, but I want you to consider something else is that the, this delinquent tax policy also covers the delinquent water and sewer bills. Mm -hmm. And so um, to that point, it is um, the administration on the tax side is much easier than it is on the water and sewer side. I will say that. Um, the, but we'd have to have a separate water sewer meeting in order to delay that or defer those. I, don't, I don't, don't you think? believe so because we were just so? talking about water and sewer. Okay. It's in this delinquent tax policy. All right. Just want to make sure we got our bases covered. Mm -hmm. Right. This uh, draft says including water and sewer. Mm -hmm. and, and the and the motion would be different than the one for the tax. Correct. Because you've got a different billing cycle. Right. Because because we've got a, a quarterly billing cycle that is rolling, which which is Correct. what makes the challenge. Correct. Mm -hmm. And what are we seeing? So let's uh, let's take care of the property tax piece first, and then let's have a conversation about what we're seeing for delinquency in water and sewer. So looking at the property tax piece, we had a motion in a second for the treat the October pan same same as we treated the March payments. And we gave them 90 days, correct? Or did we just say a date? I think we should say a date. Okay. Yeah, I don't recall uh, the previous motion. I think, I, I, I if think you remember it, if it was, it was a, a deadline date. Yeah. Well, we said, did, did we say July 1st? Is that how we put it before? June, June 30, Perry, I think it June was. June 30th? Yeah. So we're looking October, November, December, December 30? That's, we need one. Well, do, do it on the end of a month. <laughs> that, I think it'd be. On the very end of a month, yeah. 31? Yeah. It'd be the end 31. of January. It'd be the end of what? End of January. End of January. That's okay. three months. Oh, yeah, that's right, right, the end of January. So, so you'd give them until January 31st. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's part of my motion. January 31st is a Sunday. So maybe oh. January 29th. Close of business on the 29th. Yep. No, please, please nope. pick at the end of the month. See, he likes oh, the really? End of the month. Okay. Even, even though, <laughs> even right though it's a Sunday? Basis. I'll tell you why. Because tell the state why. statute says each month or part thereof. So if you, uh, all right. So, all so right. you got yet. So January 31st. They can drop it in the drop box on Sunday. So, so just to be clear, what we're saying now is that we're going to waive interest for late payments until January 31st. We're gonna say, we're gonna, just like we did last time, we're gonna encourage everybody to pay theirs on time. But if folks are having a hardship and you need to turn it in late for whatever reason, they can do so no questions asked until the end of January before we will start assessing any kind of interest. Correct. You got that motion, Adolfo? You got that written down? We got it down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we still have a motion in a second, right? With Perry and Tom? Perry and Larry, wasn't it? Oh, Perry oh, and Larry, Tom yeah. Tom was in there originally. Okay, so we're switching. Sorry, lost track. All those in okay. favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stained. That one's done. Water and sewer. Uh, what are we looking at on that for a delinquency rate? The... In terms of what, what we're not collecting, Trini? Yeah, so uh, looking at what type of relief we should provide to folks similar to the property tax. Are we seeing a high demand there for that? Are we are our revenues lagging behind there? The, co the collections are 
by and large in line with what they've been. You know, I've been monitoring that pretty closely and our, our delinquency aging hasn't grown, has not grown significantly, which is what you would expect if, if there was um, an issue with collections. You know, there's the, we, we have a list of probably about 20, 20 customers um, that we are, we, we chase them whether there's COVID or not. Mm -hmm. And for, for the vast majority of these of folks, the water sewer bill is much smaller than property tax. Bill. Yeah, it's probably more manageable. Yeah. So that's probably easier for them to pay than it is to pay their, you know, half of their share of their bigger tax bill. And, and the delinquencies that a lot of many of the delinquencies that we see are as a of what I attribute directly to the slowness of the mail these days. Oh wow! Because we're, we're not we're not a postmark town. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should become a postmark town. We could. <laughs> I mean, if it's gonna, if somebody mails their bill on the day it's due and it saves all the hassle of adding interest and penalties and all that, it seems like that's pretty minor. But my concern on the water sewer is that we not do something that impacts the revenues given the bonds that we have to pay out of that special fund. So if we're not seeing an increase in folks not able to pay their water sewer bill. I'm not really hearing the need for any relief on the payment due date unless somebody's picking up on something I'm not. I, I sent out, I think, eight or nine 90 and 120 day letters this month combined. Oh, that's not, not, that's not significant then. And, and, I, and I think I had six others of people that hadn't responded the previous month. So a total of 15. Yeah. So I think that one's probably not, not needed as much as the tax bill. Yeah, I agree. Anybody yeah. disagree with that or want to do anything? Hearing nothing, anybody want to make a motion on the delinquent tax policy draft that we have? I have a question on it. Should we be consistent on what's delinquent? Because the tax policy says at the close of business and uh, water and sewer says 430. That's easily changed, Pat. It could, I don't care what it is, but I think that would be easier if they were both the same. I, I think 430 is clearer, more specific. Sure, that's okay. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions? Motions? Question I have is it, is it going to go to 430 or close of business? I don't care. You're the one that's got to administrate it. What would you prefer? <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think uh, Cliff uh, just a suggestion so that you know, I just to make it easier for for folks who you know I'd hate to put it any other way, but just less sophisticated with what close of business means. Uh, you know, we've had we live we are in a community where people work at random crazy hours and. You know, working at different times, so their interpretation of right. business uh, business hours is different than the standard office hours. So I think if and if we do lean towards just a specific time, people will know it's four thirty. Yep. Yep. That's good. Done. Good for me. I'd like to ask a question about the postmark. Uh, I think the That's statement it. was that we are not a postmark town. That's that correct. correct? I'm not sure many people realize that because that's news. Yeah, to they me. do. It's right in your bill. Yeah. Well, I've seen it's the bill. Communicated for, in the bill. Yeah, I've seen the bill for four years, and and I, and I never read that closely. So I'm not sure everybody un, understands that. 
So I'm, as I guess my question is, is there any reason why we can't be a postmark town? We can be any kind of town we want to be, John. <laughs> right now, though, we're not. We're a pay the clerk by 430 on the date it's due town. <laughs> and the invoices are out, so we can't change them this round. Well, I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about for in the future. Mm -hmm. it's definitely something we can consider. Do I think it, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't that have to come up on the town meeting? We vote on when property taxes are due. It's voted mm -hmm. on the floor. I would imagine that that's where the motion has to say, not that they have to be paid on that day, but that they have to be postmarked by that day. Well, we've always been a, you gotta have your taxes in by this particular time. I don't think it's been a problem for years. I don't know why we would need to change it. Uh, and you get four to six weeks to figure out how to get it there by that day. As much mm -hmm. as we all like to wait until last minute well, uh, yes. I'm guilty. I go in on the last day, but yeah, yeah. me too. And I've been caught once or twice over the years. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, for but the that's all dependent, I believe, on the motion from the floor. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm not sure 100, percent but anyways. All right. I'm so... good. With four We've made the change in the policy to 430 instead of close of business. Any other comments or changes folks would like to see? Anybody want to make a motion to adopt it? So moved. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? I'm assuming that's an aye, Pat, because you're on mute. That's an I, yep. Okay. Motion carries. I will make the changes and get a clean copy to you for signatures. Awesome. Town meeting and town report. Well, we've had uh, it's that time of year where we are going to present uh, dates and times and ask the select board to um, start uh, thinking about the end of year and town meeting. Uh, so Emery was... Um, uh, kind enough to put together new dates, um, new uh, requests to make to the board. And in your packet, um, you have uh, the documents created by Emery and I'll hand it off to him so that he could um, share a little bit more about the work that he's pulled in. And uh, Emery, I'll, I'll take minutes while you uh, brief the board on this. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Let me get my video going again. So yeah, I've been going through Shannon's old files, the old town reports. The dates are updated. I've double checked them with Joyce. They're all good to go. I'm in contact with our printer briefly. Made reached out to the fire advice uh, the Saint Randolph Center Fire Association that it would need to be um Gain to gather petitions to get back on. No response from them yet. Um, and then I'll be finalizing the general letter and sending that out tomorrow. The letter to all the standard NGOs. Great. So from a select board perspective, um, we're kind of on easy street for this meeting, but in November, we need to be ready to set extra meetings in December for the budget, correct? Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Yeah, that's correct, Trini. There's also the selection or the consideration Any by questions? the board. There's also the consideration by the board for um, the dedication of the town report. Um, also, selecting a member of the board to draft the message from the select board to the town report. Um, so yes, Trini, just to confirm you are correct. Next meeting, there will be a lot more requested of the select board. Okay. 
This is great to have dates, Emery. Um, Likewise. I'll be working under the same schedule. As much as we don't like to be tied to deadlines sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just I want also, if I may, like to point out that Emery was kind of you know, thrown into the fire on this one, uh, just timing wise. He came in right at the perfect time to just be thrown right in. He's jumped right on in. He's communicated well with Joyce, worked on the state statute mandated deadlines. And um, yeah, uh, so far he's been really kept all of us on task with creating this list. So thank you. Share that with the board. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. So next we have the review of the request for bids for Beanville Road Culvert. Uh, yes, we finally um, determined that the federal government is not going to provide any additional aid for putting people back to work. Um, you know, just it's it's still it's been a uh, I wouldn't say a nightmare, but it's been challenging to navigate the the COVID support for for towns and municipalities. Um, so we're now at the point where we have revisited the issue with issue with A and R, revisit, revisited the issue with VTrans. Um, uh, at this point, you know, we, we would like the select board to consider uh, if it doesn't have any comments with the RFP that's in front of them, we could then release it as quickly as possible to schedule the work that is needed on Beanville Road for the spring of next year. Uh, we have the funds um, identified for the project and really would like to take care of it as quickly as possible. I might be missing it, but I haven't seen that RFP. No, I don't see it either. Was it not in your... It's not in the email you sent, Adolfo. Oh. So let's talk about the funding for this culvert. What's our engineer's estimate on this? The initial engineer estimate was three hundred and eighty-one thousand um, dollars, which you know it, it, it was a bit high. Um, we have since worked with A and R. We we've identified funds to cover that potential cost. Uh, we have worked with A and R. I'm sorry, with VTrans um, on the specs that were presented to the town. Uh, we feel that if we do release the, the request that um, we encourage potential bidders that we say, look, this is what was presented to us. Options um, that deviate from the specs that are in the, in the, um, in the RFP may vary, but any any varying components have to be cleared by A and R. Uh, a and R is, is who's driving the requirement at uh, this particular section of Beanville Road with the new culvert. So we want to be clear that if any alternative is presented to what we're sharing in terms of engineering specs, that the bidders know that if they're deviating from the specs that were presented by our engineering firm that those specs have to be approved by a and in order for the town to select them. Okay, so we have an engineer's estimate of 381. And how much is the grant from VTrans? Uh, it has been increased to $175,000. And the balance is coming from where? From our reserve funds. From the town? From the town. We did receive notice today, it actually came in today that we were not approved or we didn't receive a, a better roads grant that we had applied, which would have been for $60,000. Um, I think there was just a competitive process and we didn't, we didn't receive it. And we have at least the 206 in reserve? We do. Uh, conversations with Chris Bump at the VTrans office, were they able to increase that grant at all? Uh, they did increase it. It was initially 157 uh, and it was increased to 175. Yeah, so were they able to increase it yet again? 
So uh, each year, just so folks understand, I'm, I'm, I'm really serious about this because we allocate funds across these projects and some come in under budget. So there might be 12,000 here, 10,000 there, 5,000 there, 7,000 there, whatever. Like they have the ability to reallocate that. So I'm just wondering if, if they happen to have some that come under budget that they could reallocate to this project to help us not have to make up as big a difference. That's all. I, I could absolutely reach out to Chris again and just to, to make the inquiry, make the final ask before we send out the, the request with the, you know, with the specifics. Yeah, just tell him I'm being a stickler. I want to know <laughs> that we've wrangled every cent out of him we can. <laughs> do that <laughs> any questions on the project around the putting it out to bid no i think it's long overdue exactly and we'll we'll see the bids when they come in yeah we'd like to see what's good what we get for sure yeah absolutely yep yeah. um uh the the bid process uh, let me start over the bid form specifically spells out the process and in that process it says that the select board is to consider and select the winning bidder so yes the board will see the bids before before the contract is awarded as a matter of fact the, the board will award the contract any questions or motions on this So I just need a motion to move forward with the RFP. Yes, to go ahead and so put forward. it out to bid. Okay, I, that's my motion. I'll second that. Before I bring it to a vote, just a quick question. What do we have for a completion date on that bid, Adolfo? Uh, we next didn't construction season? Yeah, it has to be completed next construction season because the existing okay. grant that we have will expire next year. Um, so I'm only asking because some of the work that we're putting out right now that has to be done by December timeframe, we're getting outrageous bids on. So, mm -hmm. okay. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, next up is grants. Uh, not to, it's just more of a comment and we had an issue. It wasn't an issue. I'm sorry. News to share that I put in the manager's report section, but, um, it does relate to grants. Uh, I had received word from, uh, Josh, our economic development director, that one of our previous grants had been increased and it was a grant from, uh, the Let's Grow Kids, I believe the grant had, had been increased by $20,000 for mm -hmm. uh, a child care uh, project that we've been working on for the better part of the last year. Uh, but that's the only news that we have for grants. Okay, so we have one more, actually. The East Randolph Valley Group has... Oh, yep. Uh, raised about $7,000 in funding to go towards an architect study. The study has a quote from an individual, but um, in all honesty, they have not actually seen the building uh, that comes in around 12,000. Another group is around 15,000. Uh, they're asking if the town is willing to match the funds that they've raised so far on that architect study on a dollar for dollar basis. So for every dollar they've raised, will the town kick in a dollar? This will give them the report they need of the work that has to be completed on that building to bring it back into public use um, and allow them to start their capital fundraising campaign to actually raise the money that's needed to do those items that comes out of this list. So the ask tonight is whether the board is willing to uh, match on a dollar for dollar basis up to, I believe it's $7,500 um, to get that architect study completed. This is a huge stumbling block on them doing their capital raising. Mm. Trini, I think, 
I think they've been working real hard. So I would move to um, the town will commit to match up to 7,500 for the architectural design. I'll second that. Uh, before we move to a vote, are there any questions from anybody on this? I would just question where, where would that $7,500 come from in the budget? I have no issue with it except to try and understand. Um, it's not something that would have been budgeted for, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, Tom, if, if we are to find the 7,500, it would most likely have to come from the facilities reserve fund. Okay. Um, you know, they, it, it is possible that um, we would be able to, to find the 7,500. So, you know, if you feel comfortable to make the motion, um, I would work with Cliff to try to, you know, uh, try to find a way to, to make the, make the match. I know you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a second and a motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next Thank up you, is everyone. old business. Trini. Yes, Betsy. Trini. I just want to thank you guys for supporting this. Um, we certainly have our 75. We've got the 3,000 from Lamps and Howell. And we've gotten just recently had the rest come in so that we can match the 75. And we know that if the bid is for some reason more than 15,000, we will work on getting that money to supplement or support or add on, whatever it's called. <laughs> Thank you, um, Betsy. What, us, <laughs> what, when we have the money, do we just let Adolfo know? Do you want a check? How does that happen? Just yeah, coordinate yeah. it with Adolfo and Cliff. Yeah. Okay. And so we'll put out the bid for the services and then the coordination will take place as payments are due. As I, you know, lots of times you have consultants say it's going to be X number of dollars and it can be less than that, what they actually invoice once they figure out what they're really into. Okay. So we don't want you to transfer the funds over because it may come in at each party only has to kick in 5,000 or 6,000, right? Okay. It's an up to motion. So mm -hmm. that can all be coordinated with Cliff and Adolfo. I have a quick question for John and Betsy, which is just that um, the architects you're reaching out to, are they um, specialists in public facilities or in historic facilities, uh, or are they general um, practitioners? Well, my understanding about bids is that they are announced, and then Whoever once the people uh, see what's in it, they whoever is interested right. submits a bid. Okay. Uh, Tom, to one of the architects that has responded was through the Preservation Trust. Yeah, that's kind and, of what I was getting at, John. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, yeah. I would think a person with that kind of um, historic preservation expertise um, might have a leg up on some of the other more general practitioners but sure that that that's to be to be clear that's exactly what we're looking for yeah yeah and we might have somebody that's you know attached to randolph that will look at it with a little sure. less money sure. um does this rfp then have to go through the board before it's it goes out to bid the board votes to allow it to go out to bid and then we accept who the preferred selection is. So we're, I'm thinking of a timeline training. So it looks like um, before anything actually gets published in a, wherever the RFPs get published, it will be after the November select board meeting. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. But I'm guessing but you'll probably need that time to put an RFP together. Okay. And by the way, this is a banner hanging from the hall 
that our firemen put up for us Monday night. Oh, very nice. So sweet. if you get a chance to cruise through East Randolph, things are happening. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we have old business. Nothing under old business. How about other business? <laughs> Nothing there either. <laughs> Gee. Oh, I have something. Yeah, go, Pat. We got a letter from Dennis Brown. Were we going to look at that tonight? I just I, got it, and I haven't read it yet, so I'd prefer to <laughs> wait on that. If it's helpful to the know. board, I did speak with Dennis uh, today. So I've been work I've been working with with he and Mimi to try to make sure that uh, I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, he did mention to me today that he would be sending a message to the select board. Uh, I shared with him that um, you know it's best to have the select board have time to digest information that's sent to to the board. Uh, he was perfectly fine with this coming to the board next month uh, as an official agenda item, as opposed to um, something occurring today, um, if that's helpful to the board. And I, I haven't received anything. Uh, presumably, you're referring to getting it through your select board email, Pat? It came late you... this afternoon. Yeah. came mid-afternoon, I think, late afternoon. Uh, from Dennis. I don't, I don't see it in uh, from Dennis directly. I don't see it in my email. So um, if someone could forward that to me or ask Dennis to do so. I'll do it for you right now. Okay, thanks. I'm happy to wait. I just wanted to acknowledge. Um, sure. The agreement. Check your email. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like it arrived. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Given that it's not on the agenda and everybody hasn't had time to digest the information and nothing else under other business, let's move on to the manager's report. I know I always say this, that I'm going to keep it brief, but this time I will. Um, <laughs> uh, the just first thing is it's, it's one of the, uh, uh, it's a good thing. We've had a, uh, a bit of a musical chairs on Merchants Row with regard to our businesses. Uh, we've had Black Crim move, move into a much larger space and everything looks like, you know, they, they're, they're enjoying their bigger space. Um, people are enjoying being in the bigger space, uh, which is great. The move, so the, the, essentially the growth of one of our businesses to a bigger space has allowed the space to Black Crim's previous space to now um be occupied by a new business that is going to be going in relatively soon um uh, i don't think it's confidential information their name is on on the door so i believe it's the taco all-stars that are going to be moving into the uh, the, the crim's old location so it's diversifying the dining options in, in randolph uh, which is a good thing um we Again, I did previously mention the increase in the grant from Let's Grow Kids, which is a good thing. Um, the I've been working with folks over at ACCD to try to uh, bring back the in-person meetings. I know, uh, Larry, you, you had initially talked about having in-person meetings again. Um, it's definitely possible. I just want to make sure that if we do have uh, an option for the board for in-person meetings that we have options for folks that, you know, in case we do have a mass audience of 50 who want to do, attend a select board meeting on a second Thursday of the month that we have a, a capability of not having to shut the meeting down because yeah. there's too many people in one location. Right. Can, so, can we, Adolfo, to do that, can we have a, just, can we have a meeting where, you know, the select board and you and maybe Emery are in, are in the, a room together and the rest of the meeting is is remote for folks can we uh, do like that i i'd have to i don't you know I'm not, i don't want to say yes because i don't know that if we have a meeting that it has to be open to the public um at a physical location i think that was the purpose of the legislature's being allowing us to do this remotely and all the rules that they put in 
I think once we advertise a physical location, or if the board chooses a physical location, that we have to have people with access. But I, I'm not 100% sure that what I'm telling you now is correct. So I, 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 if it's possible to do that, absolutely. You know, I, I will share that with the board, and then uh, Larry, you and the board can make the decision to be able to do that. Right. Um, so I could certainly explore whether that option is possible. Because it seems like logistically it would be a lot simpler since now we're in pretty much an indoor season, you know, to have a space where if there was just like seven of us who needed to be there physically, that we could be, you know, spread out enough to maintain our distance and uh, we wouldn't need a, you know, a gymnasium to, to do that in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I will explore whether that's possible. And I, I don't think it's not possible. I just, I don't mm -hmm. want to say yes or no sure. without having the facts. But yeah, absolutely. I could sure. explore that. Sure. You're not loving the comfort of your home? I, I do actually <laughs> like it quite a bit. But, um, but I, I really think it's good for us to have that. It's just, it's just the conversation is, is just a little more difficult. I, I feel like there's certain communication which maybe doesn't happen, which, which would happen if we're all in the same space together. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just think it'd be good for our, our deliberations for us to be in the same space. You know, Zoom's okay, but it's a little, you know, it's a little awkward. Getting easier all the time. You're just not <laughs> Zooming enough. <laughs> maybe that's it. It's all in my head. <laughs> Gary, just from a time management perspective, how quickly you can change meetings is awesome. Exactly. Yeah. You can have more yeah. than one at the same time. And, and, and there is some value. To, there is some value to the mute feature too. At times. Yeah, there is. I think they could use it in the debates. Uh, at the presidential <laughs> so, so, uh, so, going back to the. So the merchants row when does construction start there on the effort at the end towards pleasant street in the um sidewalks that was supposed to be this fall yes that was my next my next topic um there were issues reported to us by d and k um initially we had discussed postponing the project because we wanted to not in, uh, create any problems for our businesses during COVID and outdoor seating. Um, since then, DNK reported to us that they did not have as successful conversations that they would have wanted to have had with uh, contractors that were going to do the sidewalk work. So they have since recommended to us that we go out to bid so that we can receive bids from contractors to do the work, to do the sidewalk work with DNK's engineering. Um, so that's it's it's been a challenge managing that project um, now because we initially were not planning to go out to RFP. DNK was going to manage and hire somebody to do it, but now we have to we have to go to RFP uh, to select the contractor because of the advice of DNK. So, so my understanding is they have two contractors. Yeah, I was going to say we have two contractors. Right, we have two that have submitted bids. One doesn't use an internal concrete company. The other one does a fair amount of it internal. Is around, if I understand correctly, around 15,000 more because they do some of that stuff internal and take the risk of it. But that the work could still be done this fall. I'm. Uh, I, I just want to understand, I mean, it seems like it's a project that we should do the entire project as scoped. And if there's a way to, to save it and do it this fall, that should be our focus. I, I, that would be my preference. I, Trini, I think you have information that Dean Kay has not shared with me. What was shared with me was that they, 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 well, I'll be honest, they didn't tell me that they had received any information from contractors other than they were not having success in speaking with them. Um, so I could reach out to our project engineer, DNK, and ask them to give me everything they have so that yeah. we could potentially move um, forward this year. Unless anybody has a problem with it, I would, as long as we're within the budget that was set, I would much rather move forward with it this fall and get that completed. You know, I think at this point, we are not doing outdoor seating because it's a little bit nippy out there and windy, but um, 
you know, if we could get it completed now and get that done, the only challenge I believe they have is with any plantings. Those would have to be next spring. And I, I understand that part. Um, but if we could rescue this project and get it done this fall, I think that's a, a great thing to do. Yeah, I, I would agree with that simply because I think you're going to find you're going to have less traffic disruption if you do it this fall versus if you try to pull this off next spring. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. Yeah, Trini, absolutely. I would be more than willing to join you in those conversations, Adolfo. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'll let you know the next time it happens. <laughs> awesome. Okay, what else is in the manager's report? Uh, the last thing is that uh, ANR had uh, provided to solid waste districts um, or, you know, like trash districts, in our case, Mountain Alliance, food composting buckets to distribute to local schools with the understanding that some students are no longer going to cafeterias to have their meals or eating in classrooms. Uh, our allocation was uh, 58 buckets. Uh, we distributed buckets to Orange uh, Southwest School District. Uh, we gave them 36 buckets and the remaining buckets were given to uh, Northfield Middle and High School so um, they can have composting in the classrooms. And that's it, that's all, that's all I have for the manager's report for tonight. Can we, can we have a, just an update on where we're at with the manager, time manager search? Uh, well, we have, uh, the resumes and cover letters that have been shared with the board are the only ones that I've received. Um, you know, I've shared them with the board if there's any preference. Um, the announcement that was posted does indicate that the position is open until filled. It also indicates that um, the, the select board has the discretion to consider candidates and interview them as as people you know submit information so if the board wants to interview someone it can um that's where we are where did we advertise uh position is posted on the town website so at this point we received from adolfo uh the resumes and cover letters that were received with no advertising. So I think it's um, a good idea for the board to look at those. I saw at least a couple candidates that would be pretty good to explore. Yeah. Um, so maybe we look at those candidates and decide if we want to have some discussions with them, interviews, um, however you want to call it. Uh, and if we do, let's get those scheduled. And if not, we can go on a more hardcore press of reaching out to more of the regional, national uh, organizations. But, um, you know, I think there's, it's pretty impressive the number of people that have come forward with absolutely no advertising already. Uh, and I've had conversations with a few of them that have called. Some are prior town managers, um, and some are uh, very well disciplined project managers, which I think is a big piece of what a town manager does is manages a whole variety of projects that are going on throughout the town. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think we have some folks that have expressed interest that have the skill set and the experience that we need. Um, so before we assume the, and I'm not saying it's not worth the investment to do the advertising and go larger if we need it. I'm just saying I'm not totally convinced we need it at this point. Um, and it's out there and people came forward without even any advertising whatsoever. And that's the list you got mm -hmm. um, forwarded to you. So. I would agree, Trini. I, I just gave cursory glance to the cover letters and the resumes, but there were at least um, there were a handful that really stood out on paper, at least as um, being wor very worthy of further exploration. Uh, so, 
Yeah, and we we did a training one time with employees on how to write resumes, and you can take the cans back on Sunday to get your money back, or you can be a recycling engineer on your resume. So, like, what it shows on paper is one thing, and we've done this before and had the interviews and been like, oh, man, you're just the guy that picks up the cans on the side of the road and takes them back. But, you know, it's worth our exploring it because we do have some local folks that have expressed an interest that understand the dynamics of the town and have been very interested in mm -hmm. the R3 process and building and, and looking at what we're looking at doing. So, um, you know, I would encourage everyone to look at those resumes that are there and see who you might want to interview. And maybe we set those up on a day that everybody can do. Um, and that, or if you say, you know what, this is just too small a pool, we really ought to go out with a national search. Mm. We can look at what the cost of that is. I think it was around 10,000 that we spent on the national search. Yep. So um, that'll give you some idea of, of what that expense would be. But, mm -hmm. um, and so maybe we look at those resumes and then come back, I don't know what, give a week to look at those and decide if there's some in there we want to interview uh, and maybe get dates back of when everybody could do that. Um, well, I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> I'll look, but you aren't going to see me again until November. So I'm happy to let you guys take that on yourselves. We um, would do you in a tree stand, Perry. You would do what? <laughs> We would take you in a tree stand. It would be okay. okay. Well, yeah, I'm pretty. I got an internet service there, but yeah, I can do it remotely. I'm happy to do that, but I won't be in physically. I won't physically be here. So. And I think these are going to have to be remote. First yeah. level is probably always remote. So. Yeah. 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 I don't. I don't see a problem with that. Okay. We can do it by Zoom. Sounds perfect to me. Sounds good. At this point, we have five resumes. Is that right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what I saw in the email from Adolfo yesterday, or whenever it was. Do you want to coordinate it through you? Do you want to coordinate it through you, Trini, and with our comments on each one, or how do you want to? How about if by Wednesday we send Adolfo the names of the ones we would be interested in interviewing? And then we'll collate that and figure out the ones that everybody's interested in interviewing, or at least the majority. Yeah. And see if we can schedule and send dates that you'd be available to do those interviews. And then we'll take that data and compile it into what the candidates are able to accommodate and see if we can get a schedule for the ones that have expressed interest so far. And we'll do the interviews and at the end of the interviews, we'll have a chit chat and decide if we want to go out on a bigger search or if we think we've found the magical one. Mm -hmm. That seems fair. Yeah, that do seems we, fair. Do we want to do a, is this going to be a full full board interview? Yeah. Did we do that last time? Did we, I think it was just part of the board that just, that was in on the interviews. We, we did both, Larry. We did. Uh, we had a committee. Uh, there was a group that joined us that we had selected along with a couple board members. We did the first round interviews, and then we presented them up to the board. So I mean, we can create a committee to interview those. We did have the board and some others review the resumes and come up with the short list that that committee reviewed or mm -hmm. interviewed. Right. Well, we have such a small list right now. I think it would be probably premature for us to go that route right now. Um, I'm I'm comfortable with with having all of us sit in an interview with a couple of candidates if we identify mm -hmm. people that seem good. Yeah. 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 I'm fine with that. Okay. So by Wednesday, if we could send Adolfo the list of who we would like to interview and dates that we have available that we could commit to doing those interviews. Then we can try to coordinate all that. Uh, I'm presuming we would do them in the evening. I mean, 
I could send out a doodle poll and yeah. everyone can just you know pick times that work for everyone. That's okay. Nice. Yeah, and then we can sounds like a good idea. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. I'll have a real background like Larry's there when I probably see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> and Sounds where will that be? Where, where will that be? Where are you headed? Well, somewhere's between, I don't know, Utah and Arizona and New Mexico. Wow. Oh. So. You want middle of the day because prime hunting is the morning and evening. I won't be hunting for the first week or two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, doodle poll's good. Everybody send their candidates and dates. That would be good too. Um, any other topics? I have a question. Where are we at with the fire station and the fire truck? Which fire station, Pat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the new one, are we, are we settled on insurance with that? And same with the fire truck? With Randolph Center? No, the village department. No, we're still arguing with the insurance company. On both? Yes. Hmm. It's actually in court. Oh. Okay. oh, sorry, Pat, you're referring to the uh, uh, the subrogation suit? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Trini's correct. It's still in court. Uh, it's... From what our attorney has shared with us, it's going to be several years before this is settled. Um, it's already been several years, and it's just going to continue for a while. Of course, it's going to be, no yeah. doubt. And that, what's the issue? Because I didn't know about this, I guess. So what's the issue? Oh, the you issue don't want is... to pay. Yeah. <laughs> and we want them to, right? <laughs> what's that would the... be it. What's the issue that we we'll disagree on? We disagree on the issue of the cost of the new facility mm -hmm. and the demands that current law and requirements put on us. So they don't want to pay for the two properties that we had to take to make parking, which is mandated by zoning, which was mandated by the state legislature. And they don't want to pay for the size of the building, which is mandated by all the rules that came down from the feds and everybody else that you have to have all this clearance around trucks and, you know, the, the amount of, you know, for those of you that aren't aware, we had to have a certain size bathroom. We had to have certain size locker rooms. The men's locker room has to com comprise of the entire capacity of the department. The women's has to be at least 50% of the entire capacity of the department. And we went through all this. So they don't want to pay for that. That's on the building side. And on the truck side, it's still the whole issue of who's responsible for the part that failed that caused the fire to begin with. Thank you. That's good explanation. Thanks. Any other questions on your manager's report? Motion to adjourn.